there's no music if you have no body to play it with. So take care of your body first. You getting into the gym and you lifting weights and working on muscles is this it's physical therapy for the benefit of your playing. The truth is nothing works like just taking care of the simple stuff, diet, exercise and sleep. Take care of that and you'll be fine. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Tuned and Strong podcast. This is Angela McHouston of Music Strong. And this is Dr. Jen Cavis may of Tuned and Tone Performance. And today we are joined by a very special guest, Dr. Lee Pearson. Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. We're stoked to have you. Yes. <laughs> and if you guys don't know, Lee is like the OG of the, of the, of the body <laughs> mapping world, of the music, like fitness, health world. I mean, she has just been in this game so long. Her, mm-hmm. her, she has a wealth of knowledge and we're just itching to get into, into her brain and find out what's going on. Yeah, thank <laughs> That's you. not a creepy, I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. You're very welcome. So Lee, for people who don't know you, can you, can you tell them a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Um, I will preface it by saying that, so I, I'm a flutist. I played in pain for 30 years, starting with when I was 18, start, my left mm-hmm. hand started to go numb. And by the time I got it all figured out in my late forties, <laughs> really, I, um, I just realized, man, I don't want anybody else to go through this. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. people still are, but that was, that was my passion, which drove me to write my book called Body Mapping for Flutists, and to do the work I do now, which is work coaching musicians on how to use their bodies so they don't get hurt. And that really just means learning how your body works, learning how it's designed to work so you can use it well and play, not just play better, but really be able to express yourself. There's so much tension in what we do. And, and I just wanna help people undo that tension. So that's, you know, I help musicians. What I officially say is I help musicians recover the ability to play with joy and ease. I love that. Like that. Yeah. (laughs) Because we forget that, you know, we, we've talked about this before, but so many times musicians think, musicians think that, you know, pain and struggle is just part of the gig. Mm -hmm. No, the joy is supposed to be in there. Ease is supposed to be in there. It's not mm-hmm. supposed to be riding the struggle bus of pain all the time. Yep. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad you, that you, that you, that you said that because one of the first things that um, mistakes musicians make, I feel like, is they push through pain. They experience pain, but then they just push through. They think, well, you know, either that's part of it, or I don't have time to deal with this, or insurance right. nothing. But then it becomes the from this little ache or this little nagging something to something that's more often than chronic, and then they have no career. So I always want to know why. That's I'm always asking why. I grew up in the 70s and our mantra was question authority. <laughs> so <laughs> I, you know, I think about that. Why do people feel like they have to do that? You know, and mm-hmm. I think it's because they're just not taught to pay attention to their bodies. It's not part of our training. Yeah. Mm-hmm unfortunate and and that's really what my passion is right now is training teachers to help students learn how to use their bodies most teachers have no training in that because they teach the way they were taught or in other things that they've learned along the way which is a lot but Mm -hmm. having the body be the center of the work which it is the body creates music can't have sound without movement when when you center the body in your instruction, then you empower your students to learn how things work so they can do it again and again, easier. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. Um, I was on a podcast this morning with um, some singers and I'm curious, have you done any work with singers as well or is it mostly instrumentalists? No, I've worked with singers and with choirs, yeah. Wonderful. So what, what they were telling us today or when, it, when we were the conversation I was having today, Um, It sounds like singers and vocalists tend to get a little bit, because their instrument is within and ours is external, they get a little bit more knowledge about themselves. And as 
instrumentalist. I don't know about y'all, but I wasn't taught jack squat about my body. <laughs> I took it upon myself in college to yeah. find out. I was just told to go practice, you know, like we was told anything. So, I mean, have you, have you seen this? I mean, what's y'all's thoughts on this? Well, it's, it's actually kind of a, a, there's two things going on in the singing world that I've learned from singers. And many of my body mapping colleagues, people who teach body mapping are singers also. So I've talked with them a lot. Um, yes, they do actually spend time getting to learn the instrument. There's a lot of pedagogy. Vocal ped is a class in most schools. So they have mm -hmm. to learn what the instrument is and how it looks like. And they'll make models of it out of plasticine and do stuff like that. Um, so that's great. The downside is that there's still a lot of misinformation about breathing and about a whole lot of other stuff in teaching. And one of the main reasons is teachers often teach with imagery and they'll say things like it should feel like a river or they'll, some voice teachers actually say, and I'm sorry to repeat this, feel like you're squeezing a dime between your butt cheeks. And that's, <laughs> I mean, that is taught. Uh huh. Or you should feel like you're moving your bowels. You know, it's just like th there's so much confusion because they can't see the instrument. They tend to speak in metaphors and images that may or may not have anything to do with the reality of how the body works. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. not specific to voice teachers, by the way. Oh, no. Right. Yeah, no, I know that I've gotten a lot of that too as a, as a woodwind player. <laughs> you, know? yeah. you come back and you're like, um, that's not how that works. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, because they, they can teach us a lot about how to play the instrument, but mm -hmm. how to play our body is a whole mm -hmm. other thing, or how the body plays right. Yeah. Right. Um, so before we go any further, do you mind if we unpack that a little bit? Because I mean, obviously, yeah, I say I say obvious. It's obvious to me now. I trying to get away from the word obviously but we've all come across if you've been in lessons for any amount of time we've all come across the um descriptive instruction the the imagery that you're talking about and there's some good that comes out of that but what aside from okay this is inaccurate what is it that you find as the downside the, the biggest problem with that that's a great question and this is actually part of the of our training as body mapping teachers uh, the difficulty is that images are very personal and they don't necessarily carry over from one person to the next. So if you say, oh, your wind, your, your air should feel like a river and you're talking to somebody who almost drowned when they were a kid, it's not going to work. Ooh. However, if your student is playing and they play a beautiful phrase, and, and you say, wow, that was fantastic. How did you do that? What were you doing with your air? And they say, oh, it just felt like the air was moving like a river. That's meaningful because it's theirs, they own it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you need to use that with another student. It just means, right. okay, this is language that works for them. So we, mm -hmm. we want to, in our teaching, always, always, always find out what the student is thinking and what the student is experiencing and use that as a guideline for how we teach. And, and this is what good teachers do, right? Right. It's not yeah. a one size fits all thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're, and I'm, I'm on, like, I understand what you're saying. I know Angela does, because we also, you know, have background in this, but you know, yeah. the, the downside to say, if you're, talking you're using that river imagery and you're talking to somebody who almost drowned is it, it can cause pain right it, it's not that it doesn't necessarily work but it can actually create certainly issues. create tension yeah, yeah. so, so mm -hmm. then you're going back to the, the whole thing which I talk about all the time with my teachers which is that every ex your the way you play the way you use your body is determined by your thoughts mm -hmm. what you think about how it works your emotions, how you feel in any given moment and your experiences. So that experience of having almost drowned is gonna affect the way you breathe. I, I worked with a, an adult professional flutist at one point who had almost drowned when she was two. And what she was unable to do was to, I often do an uh, exercise where we blow out all the air and then we just wait. 
and you all can try this who are listening, just blow out all your air and then you just wait for the reflex of breathing to work. You wait for your body to breathe itself. And then you get a really beautiful, full natural breath. She could not do that because it triggered that old traumatic reflex of having almost drowned. So, mm-hmm. you know, and that created tension and, and limitation in her body. Whether she eventually worked around it, I don't know, but it'd be interesting mm-hmm. to find out. Right. Right. Yeah. I had a thought that <laughs> I lost it. I was trying to go back to like, what was the thing that I was going to, that it's gone. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, if you think of it. I know we could talk about this further too, because I've seen things uh, left and right where it's uh, the marching band is a great source of this too. That, that um, ours was a grape between your butt cheeks. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And And, and nobody ever asked, what does that feel like to breathe when you do that? Right. Or to walk. And I see (laughs) people coming, but there, that's what, you're going to squeeze and then you're going to march and okay when how many of them now have knee problems hamstring problems ankle issues hip pro- you know and because you know what else pelvic floor yeah. issues yes oh gosh yes Talk about so them. Many, especially in the woodwind field and brass field especially women it's most difficult for women because they've taught been taught to contract so strong and so deeply that the pelvic floor is in a constant state of contraction. I've I've worked with several flutists who have actually had to go and do physical therapy for their Mm -hmm. pelvic floor muscles because they were just in a constant state of contraction. And that's painful. Yeah. Yeah. And debilitating. Right. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, especially as a wind player, I mean, what we don't realize sometimes is that you know, you have the diaphragm up top, but the pelvic floor is at the bottom and they both need to move. And if one is not moving, Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then both <laughs> not they, they they actually both go down at the same time mm. and come up at the same time. But the pelvic they? floor, yeah. So there's a diaphragm pushes down, pushing all your organs down into the pelvic floor, which reacts like a trampoline, basically. Yes. It just goes ruin, and then it springs <laughs> back up as the diaphragm releases and comes back up. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. And if the pelvic floor is not elastic and toned and and you know oxygenated, then the diaphragm can't go all the way down. Yeah. 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 I think the pelvic floor is something that is just not talked about ever anywhere among you know among people at all, but it is so important with how your entire body. Is. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. I mean the whole what I find is that. This whole, sorry, this is Captain Bob here. (laughs) I named him for my dad, who was a sailor and a doctor. Um, Anyway, the whole, I'm I'm guessing you guys find this as well, this whole area between here and here that links the upper and lower bodies Mm -hmm. and is essential for the power center is murky. Yep. Really murky and sometimes just completely out of the picture. Mm-hmm. because we don't talk about it yeah. yeah we don't understand how it works we don't understand what it does we don't understand why we need to understand what it yeah. does yeah right yeah so right. I want to ask the teachers <laughs> I want to ask you a question because I'm curious about this now we are all over 30 here I think mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm actually a lot over 30 <laughs> and people who are my age let's say the the boomer age group most of us have a lot of these problems in our teaching. I'm curious about how generational this is that our, our students, I think a lot, I know the flute world better than others, but you know, the other things are changing slowly. Do you see this lack of information in all generations? Are college kids still not knowing? No clue. No. I mean, the ones that I've worked with, no clue. Wow, that's yeah. really interesting. Zero idea, the ones that I've worked with, no, I no idea how their bodies work. I mean, I even told this to like middle schoolers and high schoolers when I was teaching them. I mean, I made every, any chance I got, I would talk to the kids about, this is what your anatomy actually is. Let me show you. You, you guys yeah. know that body exhibit where they, they have. Oh yeah. Like not petrified, yeah. but uh, they, preserved. Yeah, yeah the cadavers. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, cadavers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I saw the uh, I saw that exhibit in New York a few years ago, and they said no pictures, but there was a cross section. They had somebody's torso, which this sounds crazy, but somebody's torso was there, and it was the diaphragm. And I went, oh, I am taking a picture of this, and I show this to every kid. I'm like, you, they, and they were immediately grossed out. I'm like, no, 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 you have one of these. We're gonna find it. We're gonna talk about what it does, and they just, ah, you know. But I mean, they they need to know. Right. If you're a wind player, my gosh, you need to know. If you're a brass player, you need to know. I mean, everybody should know about their body and not just be speaking in metaphorical pictures. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, I, I, that's very interesting to hear. I, I'm working with a university on a, a residency and I asked them to put out surveys to the students and the faculties on whether you are experiencing any pain or limitation or tension. I don't have the numbers for you because I just got these in and I haven't memorized the numbers yet. But here's what's interesting. Only a small percent of the faculty thought their students were, in, were having problems with pain and tension. The students are like huge numbers of them mm -hmm. said I have pain or tension sometimes or most of the time. Mm -hmm. mm. Talk about a disconnect. Yeah. Yeah, so that's not a good disconnect either. No. That's so let me guess, are the students telling the teachers? I'm gonna guess not. That was one of my other questions. Do your students tell you? You know, do you yeah, and I haven't delved into that yet, but so I'm gonna make it a, a point whenever I do a residency now to make sure I do a class for the faculty on who is at risk, how do you tell if they're at risk, how do you watch, how do you see whether they're in tension or not in tension you know how can you tell if yeah. somebody is playing with tension mm -hmm. people don't always right. know and they're not always watching the student either a lot of times what do you what do you in your experience when you had lessons what were your teachers watching when you played oftentimes the music yeah that's what mine were yeah yeah and you know I what the funny thing is they don't need to watch the music because they already know it. No way. Right. <laughs> Why yes. are you looking at the music? You know, mm -hmm. you need to know the measure numbers. You can go back and find it. But really, yeah. let's start watching the students. And let's not just watch them from close up. Let's watch them from a distance so we can see their whole bodies. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. So what 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 you're saying, I mean, I, I believe that because like we said, the, the kids have no clue. Like we're not we're not. I know I'm not seeing um, students that I'm teaching, whether it's in a, a private setting or if it's in a residency or whatnot. There's just not a lot of knowledge about this. There's a lot of knowledge about this, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. not, you know, the, the fingers in the embouchure and the emotions. But what if, you know, I love to ask these kids, hey, what is the back of your, what did the back of your knees feel like when you play? What about mm -hmm. the space behind your left earlobe? What, you know, what about the, yeah, weird, weird areas you yeah. don't think about, yeah. but we get so disconnected. And, you know, when you don't have body awareness that way, and then you don't have body awareness anatomically, it's really kind of a recipe for um, disaster. But when, when pain strikes and you don't mm -hmm. know what to do, the fear response is to just shove it away and ignore it because no one, no one said anything about it. So you must be the only one. Right. Well, and the that fear is. response is for your body to go like this. Right. Even version. worse. <laughs> so that makes it worse. Yeah. Jen, you're a clarinetist. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Did you see this, as much of this among uh, woodwind students as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. Um, yeah. Lots of um, frozen shoulder. Usually it's either the sexy shoulder is a result. If you can't see me, I'm, I'm just doing a <laughs> circular. Like, you know, rolling that one shoulder. So, <laughs> you know. It's usually, I think, from, and I'm, I'm guessing because you can't always diagnose, right? So um, I think it's either symptomatic of tension there that they're trying to get rid of, like, you know, Elvis and the numb legs, or it's, it's the thing that leads into frozen shoulder. What did you say, Elvis yeah. in the non legs? What? Numb, numb legs, the, uh, his, his leg swings, the, um, the legend around, I don't remember the other word for legend, so we're going to go with legend today, but the legend around that is that his his uh, whole knee shaking thing is that one of his first concerts, he was on stage and his feet started going numb, so he started. Oh. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I have never heard that. Oh, wow. I, I don't know how true. true. 
<laughs> I so, don't know. Here's, here's my take on the situation. The reason we have so much upper body tension, I mean, and every 90% of the people you know have it, and they'll say, I carry my tension in my shoulders and my head. Mm -hmm. The main reason is that it's compensation for not having support from the ground. Mm -hmm. Because when you learn to really connect to the ground and let the ground support you and let your postural re reflexes take over, then all of this can just let go. And, and your, your arm structure, which is literally suspended from your head by mm -hmm. muscles can just go <sighs> and stop overworking. But yeah. you know, that's the kind of stuff that's never taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's interesting we're going down this path and I'm really glad we are because it's not been talked about yet at all. But Jen and I have talked about several times, you know, we've talked about the research that's going on and the research keeps saying the same darn thing. We know that musicians are injured. We don't need any more studies, I don't think at this point, to prove that musicians are injured at a really high rate. We've got that. How about we have some studies on what are we doing about it? Well, <laughs> if there's, I mean, the awareness is there. What's the next step? The next step is to, to educate the teachers. Because otherwise, how are we, when you put the impetus, like you and I were talking the other day, when you put the impetus on the student, how are they supposed to know things? Right. Right. And, and the other part of this that just drives me crazy is because we have this culture of the master teacher and the powerless student, it's, it's really reinforces the student as not being able to ask questions. So you, if you think about it, when, when serious musicians come into their real teachers in high school or college, they're like, oh, please teach me uh, whatever you say, you know, they're not nurtured to be asking questions and to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the best flutists I've ever met, Joran Markusen, who is a Swedish flutist, is, is he's actually the freest player I've ever seen. And there's two things that are really interesting about him. One is that he had scoliosis, so he has a steel rod in his spine. So he had to learn early on how to use his hip joints and not you know, not bend at the waist. But the second part was that he started studying quite late in life, like as a late teenager. And so he said, he never took what the teacher said as, you know, the gospel. He always had his own thoughts and his own ideas. And for mm -hmm. me, that speaks to what we're lacking in our teaching that this top down teacher tells you what to do. You're the student, you do what they say, and nobody asks you how it feels. Nobody says, well, so we just did that high register exercise. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious about how that felt in your neck or your arms, or your fingers, where you, you know, what did you notice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds so obvious, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think, do I ask those questions? Now that you've brought it up, like, I ask a lot of questions. Is that one of them? I do, but that's a learned behavior from me. Yeah, I did not start out because when it was first done to me as a student, I was like, it, we, it freaked me out. I was like, what do you mean? What did I feel? <laughs> like, you know, what, exactly. what do you mean? Like, did I do it right or not? Yes or no? You know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, Just tell me, right? Just tell me what right. you did. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like, like I said, that's a learned behavior. My teaching improved because of it. Yeah. But, but how it's a do you educate behavior. artists? If you're not teaching them how to think and how to notice what's going on with their body. Mm -hmm. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So this is an interesting thought. So we've been talking a lot about feeling. And so, you know, the, the three ways of learning of the kinesthetic aural and uh, visual, right? <laughs> and we all learn in all three different ways, but we all have like a predominant way that we learn best. And I know I'm, a, I'm a, definitely more of a kinesthetic learner. And I have a feeling that y'all probably are as well. But when you're teaching these students who are not kinesthetic, I have noticed that when I, I say this a lot with my training clients, like, how does that make you feel? And they're like, I don't know. Where do you feel that? I don't know. They, they have no idea. But if like, there's some, some students you will tell, like they can, they can, they can see things better or they can hear things yeah. better. But like, how, how do we go about teaching these students who don't, not that they, they, they don't have that, but you know, kinesthetic, Learning is not their, their main one. Right, well, we all have different senses that are developed better. And some kids have a really strong oral sense. Other, you know, other people have a very 
strong tactile sense where they notice everything that's touching their skin, and which is also important for musicians, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's not just mm -hmm. hearing and, and seeing. Um, there are a lot of people, we can cultivate any sense. And so those are students who need to cultivate their kinesthetic sense. Mm -hmm. And it's not their fault, but this is something that we as teachers could get better at doing. And, and some of it is knowing that that's just what it is. You know, I, I want to take any opportunity to help the student notice what they're doing and what it feels like. So a question I learned from my teacher, Barbara Conneval is, you know, when they say, I don't know, she would say, well, if you did know, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and believe it or not, that will often get an answer. Another way is to say, well, if you were going to, let's say, so let's say this is like a 14 year old student. And you would say, well, you know, if you were going to teach a brand new beginner in fifth grade, how would you tell them about this? How would you tell them what to do? Yeah. So getting them to articulate because the more ways we can input something into our brains, the more ways we can process something, visual, auditory, uh, kinesthetic, all of that helps us learn better. We, we want to, music uses the whole brain and we want to use the whole brain to learn as well. Mm -hmm. All and of that's, that's fun that you bring that up because I'm really excited to hear that because I've been, I did that a lot with my kids just to check to see if they were paying attention. I'm like, all right, so you're going to teach me. And they go, what? I'm like, yeah, now I'm the fifth grader. You're the seventh grader. You're going to teach me how do I, whatever the thing was. And they look at me like, what? I'm like, throw something out there. And then I would pretend to be this totally, I don't know how, you know, and it would freak them out. I'm like, you got this, like come up with something. And so we, that whether, whether they were quote, right or not, we could build on that. At least they started thinking yeah. for themselves. That's right. yeah. And that was fun. Mm -hmm. It is fun. We had actually last week in my, this week in my teacher training program, we had a conversation about this because we were also talking about, you know, there are those kids who just don't have the ability to verbally articulate. Mm -hmm. you know, my four-year-old grandson can tell you exactly how to make coffee, how to measure the beans, how to turn on the grinder, how to put them in the grinder, what speed to put it at, how to get them out, how to brush out the little grains out of the binder, grinder, how to turn on the water, how to get the filter. I mean, he runs through the whole thing. That's a very articulate child, right? You right. have other, for, other children who just are not verbal. So we were talking about and, and just exploring how can you help students learn when they're not naturally verbal? And of course, one of the things is drawing. So I always, especially when I'm starting to talk about breathing with students, I always ask them to draw their breathing structures and I give them a little outline of the body and say, okay, draw what you think is involved in breathing. If you do this with every single one of your students one week, like at the beginning of the semester or the beginning of the year, you'll be amazed at what you find out. You know, people draw the diaphragm as a little round thing or these tiny little lungs down in their bellies or a sheet, you know, a flat line for the diaphragm. I mean, it's just fascinating. What they are drawing is their map and that's their understanding. So, mm -hmm. and that's a great way you can go and compare their picture to what it actually could look like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's a wonderful way of helping them understand. Yeah, so anything yeah. that's not verbal, but can show them or they can make a model of it or they, you know, anything that's, that's different. Yeah. So I think this, this might be a good point to bring out something that um, we probably should have done earlier. Um, you're actually our first body mapper, which I'm super stoked about because I love body mapping. Um, but for those people who maybe don't know what body mapping is, because you just referred to this as their map, um, do you want to throw out a quick, quick description? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> um, and I don't actually use the term a lot because it's like, what's that? Right. Um, but what it's very simple. What it means is the way you think about your body, like where you think your lungs are and your diaphragm and all of that governs how you move. All right. It's it, the, your movement is controlled by your thoughts of how things work. So I'll give you a, I'll give you a simple example. So if you hold up your hand, um, it looks like your fingers end here right? So mm -hmm. move your fingers from that crease there on that side and notice how that feels. 
What's the quality of that movement? Now, if you turn your hand over, you go, oh, but the joints are way down here. So you move your fingers from those joints. And how does that feel different? Mm -hmm. It's different, right? It's easier and fluid. Mm -hmm. Then you look at a model of the hand and you realize that the finger bones go all the way down to the wrist bone. So if you move your fingers from all the way down there, that's even a different feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Angela knows this well, because she's got a pin in there now. <laughs> right, so you, you pins. <laughs> imagine that you have a student who thinks that their fingers stop here and the palm is like a solid unit. Mm -hmm. This happens. This is an actual map that some people have because they're, they use this visual cue. How mm -hmm. are they ever going to get fast technique? They're never going to be able to move their fingers fast mm -hmm. because their map is limiting their movement. So that's, that's just a very simple example. Yeah. I'll give you another one, <clears throat> which I find fascinating. So oh, um, is it the first joint of your arm? That's my second favorite one Barbara taught. Where's the first joint of your arm? Oh, right. Yeah. That so gives us a freak out over that one. This is about breathing. So you can't see the cartilage here, but for those of you who don't know, the rib bones stop here, kind of where these blue lines are. And this is cartilage, so it's very movable and flexible so our ribs can move. I had a student who thought there was no connection between the ribs and the sternum. Like this was just empty space. The ribs were just kind of floating out here somewhere. So sometimes I invite people to try on maps, try on a different map. If your student has an interesting map that you discover by drawing or something or by talking to them, try that on and see what it feels like. This person obviously had some problems with breathing. Because, <laughs> you know, she couldn't move her ribs the way they were designed to move. So body mapping <laughs> just means at accessing the maps you have, compare them to reality and make the changes you need to make to free up your movement and get, and so you can play easier. Yeah. And, and real quick, um, I think the hand one's going to be easier to translate if you're doing audio only, if you're listening to this audio only. Um, yes. First off, go check the video out for this one. It's going to be better. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, the hand one, um, you were looking at your palm and where they visually, the fingers visually appear to end from the palm, flip the hand over, you see the back of your knuckles move from there. And then looking at anatomy all the way down to your wrist bones, moving your fingers from there. So if you're trying that at home from audio only, right that's my description of it hopefully it's okay yeah, no that's good that's good <laughs> now think about an oboist or a clarinetist mm -hmm. who has to spread i mean flutists have to spread their fingers too but for clarinet mm -hmm. you have to spread to get the fingers in the right place and move them around if mm -hmm. you didn't know you had finger bones here with muscles in there that could move how could you right. ever hold the instrument no <laughs> yeah because then you're holding it from the the finger space instead of yeah all the way down yep. the yeah exactly. mm -hmm. wow well and a lot of times you're going to run into people who think that they can't reach one of the pinky keys yeah yeah because oh and my then, pinky's too short like no you're gripping that, that thumb joint is huge for for sax and and clarinet yeah. and, and as you well know yeah mm -hmm. and then what i the other thing that i find out is that most of whenever i go to a university most of the clarinetists have tendonitis Yep. And mm -hmm. they don't understand that the support for the thumb comes all the way from the back through the latissimus and down to the pelvis. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever taught them that. So they're overstraining the thumb to do it, just like you said, Angela, to do all the work of supporting instruments. Is that what you find, Jen? Yeah. Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah. That was part of my issue. That's where my injury started. And okay. And how do you help them with that? <laughs> how am I sorry? How do you help them? with that? Uh, most of the time, like you said, it's a matter of actually teaching them how their arm is built mm -hmm. and it doesn't end at your shoulder. Like, it, like you said, it goes all the way down. You have connection to the ground to support the instrument. It's not, your thumb is not doing the work here. Yeah. <laughs> Face yeah. it up to your shoulder at least, yeah. you know, like when you're, when your shoulder's unstable, 
where is that stability? The stability has to come from somewhere. Right. So if you have an unsta- instability, it's not going to be from up here. It's going to be here or it's the elbow or it's where do you have pain? Well, trace it. What's the opposite direction? Is or there might something be in the pelvis. Or yeah. in the, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Require notice usually. Yeah. One of my favorite words for talking about this is leverage. Mm-hmm. Most people know from sixth grade science, you know, what leverage is. And if you think about a pianist, you know, so they learn with their fingers and their hands, right? And they move their arms a little bit from the elbows and sometimes a little more, you know, leaning a little bit. But if you think about it, and I, and I go through this with them. So if you start with the tips of your fingers and you go all the way down your arm, around the back, through the latissimus and down to your tailbone, mm-hmm. how many feet is that? What's that distance from your fingers to your tailbone? Mm-hmm. That's for a lot of people, that's a good six feet. So you can start, oh, I have that kind of leverage for pressing those keys. Then if you had the legs in, mm-hmm. you got another four, five, six feet, you know, to the floor, right? So, wow, when I'm pressing that key, I'm actually playing from my feet. Now you can think about the distance between the piano key and where the hammer strikes the string, which is another couple of feet. So we're looking at leverage of what, 10 or 12 feet just to play the piano? It's powerful. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Then you don't have to work so hard. Yeah, That's the whole point of leverage, right? To to lessen Mm -hmm. the amount of work. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I think if y'all don't mind, I think this is a great spot for us to just pause for a minute and we're going to take a quick break and we will be right back with Dr. Lee Pearson. Hey musicians, did you know that up to 90% of musicians will experience playing related pain or injury over the course of their career? How many hushed conversations have you heard about a lingering, quote, shoulder pain or a weird tingling in your fingers or maybe low back pain or a crampy weakness or maybe you or your colleague just says, I just have to get through the gig and you watch them pop Advil like candy, maybe flush it down with whiskey. How many times have we seen something like this? So many, right? Well, it's time we start talking about our struggles, our pain, our frustrations in a private space where we don't just complain and mobilize and blindly stretch, but we learn how to strengthen our muscles, our career successes, and build each other up. I've got a brand new program that combines all of these things, and I want you to be a part of it. It's a community, not a workout. It's a community with group coaching and great content that in 12 weeks, we'll have you understanding more about your body, what you need, and how you work so you can avoid that career-threatening injury. The three things that musicians don't want. We don't want to be injured. We don't want to have a lack of stamina. And we don't want to be clueless, aka when you hurt, who do you go see? Just a quote doctor? Well, this program addresses all of those things. You're going to walk away with an immense knowledge of who to see. You're going to be empowered because you're going to know what to do should you ever get injured or should you have a colleague that gets injured. You will be able to actually offer appropriate advice. You're also going to learn about the body and the anatomy as it relates to playing your instrument and your own anatomy. And then you're going to learn how to build not just your strength and endurance, but you're going to learn how to design your own corrective exercise program. So I hope you will join me in this new program. It's called the Music Strong Pilot Program, Job Security for Musicians. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Tuned and uh, and Strong podcast. Man, I did it again. Tuned and Strong podcast uh, with our special guest, Dr. Lee Pearson. Um, We wanted to come back from the break. We were talking about body mapping before the break. We wanted to come back and talk about um, how this sort of work applies to uh, studio teacher, or not not necessarily studio teachers, but people who are teaching music and and what they are doing that's common mistakes, what they could be doing better. Um, and if you don't mind even, um, I know part of the question that I would have that I had at one point in my life um, and that I still have for people who are wanting to get into it is, well, what kind of training should you really pursue? What level of training, what depth should you really have before you start giving this advice out to your students? That's a great question. <laughs> Can you ask that again after I go through this piece? Yes. <laughs> yes it, is, it is important. So I just want to talk a little bit about our traditional model 
of teaching instruments. And I just call it studio teaching for lack of a better, better word. So mm -hmm. we have this, actually, I call it archaic model that comes from, you know, Western European male centered, male dominated culture where the master knows everything and the student listens and does what the master says. So we have this total master student relationship. It's, it's teacher focused. So the student comes in, they say, and we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, tell me, here's my playing. I practiced all week. Tell me what to do. And basically the teacher says, well, you need to fix this or that, or, you know, here's, here's the wrong note that you played, or you need to breathe here or whatever. So they're critiquing and they're telling the student and they say it over and over again. And sometimes it doesn't get through to the students. So they say it again. Then we have this piece that we talked about earlier also that we should play through pain and ignore pain. And there are teachers who tell you that you should have pain when you practice. That's just unbelievable, but it's still there. We have a system where the focus in your lesson is on the music. You come in and you bring your music and it's about how you play the music, right? Mm -hmm. We have a system where the teacher basically tells the student and the student doesn't ask very much. We have a culture of criticism. So I want you to think about this for a minute. You're a little 10 year old kid. You come into your lesson, you, you tried to practice, you play your song. What does the teacher say to you in the traditional model? Fix this, you played a wrong note. You know, what we, we tell them everything that's wrong about what they're doing. What do you imagine happens to the psyche of a child, even if they love music, when every single week they're told all the things that they're doing wrong and they are criticized? Mm -hmm. I mean, just let that sink in for a minute, what we do to children. It doesn't mean we don't love our students, but we have a culture of criticism and comparison and judgment, and we cultivate perfectionism. So when I think of all these things together, I think of this, this toxic culture that's created musicians who can never accept that they're good enough are often in tension, have tension, a lot of tension, because if you never think you're good enough, how can you ever feel good? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and then this comparison and competition, and you know, we've all had experiences of colleagues who were not generous with their praise or, you know, I have had worked with um, older musicians who were traumatized by their relationships to other musicians in the orchestra. So I see that as a system. This is the system we've been given. It's not what everybody uses, but many of us use little parts of that. So what if we could shift from this master student relationship to a collaborative relationship so the teacher and the student are learning together and asking questions together and getting curious together. What if we made it student-centered? Now, this is an aspect of education research that's been going on for over a hundred years. Montessori knew this. All kinds of education reformers knew this. And there's plenty of research that shows when this, the learning is student-guided, they learn better. Uh, so that's a big piece of it. Instead of critiquing, what if we, and th this is a big part of what I teach teachers, we learn how to observe our students. You know, how do we see if they have tension or not? What are they actually doing with their bodies? What if we start asking questions to inquire about what did you notice? What did that feel like? Some people say, well, that takes too long. I just want to tell them what to do. <laughs> and it does in the beginning, but the law in the long run, you're teaching them how to think and how to play and how to practice. What if we validated our students and whenever they did something that works, we said, whoa, that was amazing what you did. That sounded so great. What were you doing? And start asking them about it so they can learn, oh, I did that and I got that result. And maybe I can do that when I'm in performance. So they start to build a repertoire of things that they know work. Um, then this piece, instead of just focusing on the music, what if we trained our students to be aware 
of themselves and the space, not just their bodies, but the space around them, because that's a huge, huge human need to be, it's a survival instinct to be aware of your space. What if we asked, and this is my mantra, ask, don't tell. And this is what my teachers say, they come in and, I, and we start talking about this. I'm like, oh, I just want to tell them so much. I, it's hard, so hard for me to stop telling them. And there's, ask the student, what do they notice? What are they hearing? What does it sound like? What's the quality of the sound? You know, all of this stuff. So instead of the culture of criticism, what if we had a culture of celebration? And what if instead of cultivating perfectionism, we cultivated curiosity? Oh, this one, I got to pause you right here. So this, we have learned, if you don't have this, this can be a precursor to focal dystonia. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And we, we don't, yeah. we don't realize that, but if you have a student that is especially hype, like hypersensitive and very judgmental themselves and kind of self-critical and you get a teacher who's the same way, then that becomes that hyper focus, that sensation yep. fixation goes to someplace else. And then focal dystonia can happen if you don't have that acceptance. Yep. And let's go at this with curiosity and of judgment. Yeah. And it can actually change your brain maps when you do that. There's research that shows that. Yeah. That we, like instead of the two fingers having independent maps, they blend together and move as one. Your brain, wow. because that's one finger instead of two, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, we had um, Anna Ditari on. Um, she's from Hungary, I believe. And she, she does focal dystonia for musicians. Um, that's her, her training and research and help with that. But she didn't go into what you just said. That is absolutely fascinating. So I'm yeah. really glad you're There's not there. a lot of research about there yet, but um, there is, there are some things out there. Yeah. 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 If you have any of that that you're able to share, we would love to share that with people. Well, not to get you off topic here, but this is it's important it's stuff. To talk with someone who's done all that research. I'm not an expert in focal dystonia. When somebody comes to me with focal dystonia or what I call pre-dystonic condition, like they're already in that super focused type A perfectionistic space. I, I work with them on that stuff. I don't try to fix the dystonia. Sure, um, sure. Right. But yeah, I, you could talk to Holly Clemens or um, uh, what's her name at Central Michigan, Joanna White, who's done a ton of research on focal dystonia. Yeah, so, she has. Yeah, they've got a lot of great resources. Yeah. Sorry to get you off topic. So that's that, my, it's so important. <laughs> yeah, that's my big picture. That's how I see the system. That's some good stuff. It's <laughs> <laughs> <That is> all. <laughs> That is also good. So Jen, what was the question you were supposed to ask again? <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, you gave a very cultural answer and I thought we were going to go down a different path. So I would not have lumped those questions together had I known. <laughs> um, right, but that's okay. It's stuff that needs to be said. I very much agree with that. Um, but in terms of, okay, so now you're an instructor and now you know, um, okay, I need to be looking at my students' bodies and mm -hmm okay, well now I need to help them avoid these, these pitfalls or free up their movements so that their playing can be better. Um, and, and I've actually gotten this from other instructors talking, well, what do I do? What do I tell them? What do I, I'm like, right now for me, I don't know what to tell you. I need to see your student. Yeah. <laughs> you know? right. So where if start? you're right, where do you start and, and how much, how much experience do you really need in this before you can start, um, effectively teaching your students without running into some of the pitfalls of you've only got this piece of information but if you give yeah. just this piece yeah 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 right so are you talking about students who already have some limiting tension or pain or just any uh, in instructors who are working with students and they may or may not be concerned about the tension issue probably they are if they're asking about it okay yeah yeah so um the first thing I would say is that you don't have to know a lot of anatomy to do this. What you really have to do is be curious. And, and that the piece that I think is so important is the piece about inquiry. When you start asking your students what they're experiencing and try to get them to articulate it and notice, and then you can 
then you're coming from a place of, well, I don't know what's going to work, but let's find out, right? So Brene Brown has a quote, something about um, empathy. In order to have empathy for somebody, you have to be able to see the experience for what's important to them, not what you think they should be doing. Right. So we have to start asking ourselves these questions as a teacher. And this is why I've developed my teacher training program for exactly these reasons to say, you don't have to be a body mapping teacher, an Alexander teacher, a yoga teacher, a Feldenkrais teacher. Those are all wonderful. And you should do them if you want to do them. But you have to get curious about what's going on with your students. Because either, number one, they don't know they should talk about it. Number two, they don't know what's going on. As you said, Angela, they, you know, they may think this is normal. Number three, if you can help them talk about it, then you can help them find resources. So mm -hmm. let's get away from the idea that the teacher has to know everything. The teacher has to be curious and inquisitive and, and see what's important to the student. So you may have a student that is perfectly happy playing with tension and they don't care they just want to play a marching band or whatever you know you're not going to waste your time trying to spend a lot of time trying to help them because they're not going to play after they leave marching band or whatever you know on the other hand if you have a student who's looking to major in music you want to get on this stuff early and you want to help them notice what's going on um, i spend a lot of my time teaching teachers how to deal with tension, physical tension. Where does it come from? Does it come from what you're thinking? Oh my God, I'm not gonna be good enough. So that creates tension. Does it come from what you're feeling? Oh, I just, I really messed that up in the, you know, your whole body just deflates, you know, or does it come from an experience? They have parents who are really perfectionistic and are you know, I had a mother who was monitoring my practicing the whole time that, you know, I hated to practice because she was a violin teacher and she was in, the, this is why I don't play the violin, by the way. <laughs> you know, so there are all these different kinds of places where this stuff can come from, but you never know until you ask the student. 